All right, uh, welcome to the Animation Tricks of the Trade panel at BCon 2023. Woo! <laughs> that goes right, okay. Um, I'm gonna be your host for today. My name is Raymond Luke. Uh, with me, I have some amazing animators. We have Tony Garcia and Dylan Gu from Dylan Gu Studios, my coworkers, as well as Pablo Fournier and Kelty Hummerson from the Blender Studio here in Amsterdam. <laughs> I hope I said your name right. <laughs> um, if you don't know what this panel is about, hello. Um, welcome. Uh, it's going to be about animation tips and tricks that we use in our day-to-day -day workflows um, to help speed up and improve our work while animating. Um, hopefully it doesn't play yet. Um, most of the knowledge that I've gained over my career was when I was able to watch how my coworkers did things. Whether that was in studio beside them at their desks or online through screen share, I find that um, watching how other people work is imperative to developing your own workflow and figuring out new things and new tricks. Um, and if you are a fan of this kind of content, please check out the animation talks at the GDC um, because this talk is very inspired by them. And um, as always, before we do anything else in Blender, does this work? <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Um, so here's my contacts if you want. Um, this is a random selection of stuff that I've worked on from Pokemon to The Mandalorian from Ahsoka to a lot of the anime stuff with Dylan. Um, my first tip is going to be something called mouse muppeting. Um, Blender has a cool thing if you just turn on auto key and hit the space bar. You can kind of like live record your, your mouse movements to location data. Uh, and this is very handy if you grew up playing with toys and just acting out scenes like with your hands. Um, so you can get like a quick... Um, approximation of like what you want that uh, in 3D space and the timing and the arcs. And um, this is also helpful if you want to do camera handheld, uh, if you're just doing like an aim constraint. Um, so this is some random footage I shot of a little rumble my girlfriend gave me. And um, uh, like a rough matchup in Blender with my mouse. Uh, it's not like good animation per se, but it's like good enough for an idea. Um, this is what it looks like with eyeballs and feet, and what the, the live camera aim looks like, and you're just recording the data. And you have something moving, if you want to do like a Muppet animation, or like just proxy on an idea. This took me like three minutes, so um, this is handy if you just want to like play around with ideas. And you can just uh, very easily iterate by undoing and just recording it. Uh, my second tip is going to be uh, curve manipulation with proportional editing. Um, you can turn on proportional editing in the graph editor with the O hotkey, and it lets you move keyframes around with fall off. You just need to increase or decrease the, the fall off with your, your scroll wheel. Um, and it lets you very easily edit big bulks of data. Um, let's say if you're doing baked animation or mocap. Um, so for the example here, I have a character run cycle, but I wanted to keep all the, the ups and downs of the chest, but um, have the, the, start, the run start more exaggerated, lean down. So I just sculpt in the, the, the more lean, then the overshoot into the upper pose, then the settle. And you very quickly can modify big bulks of data like that. Um, here is a breathing cycle that I quickly animated, which is just scaling the chest, um, moving the shoulders up and down, and the head. Um, so the default cycle is pretty basic. Um, then if I was to edit that into um, a shot context, if I want to exaggerate the acting, she can start off more leaned up, then as the end of the shot, she'll reserve and go down. Like that. Well, it makes tweaking animation very easy. And here is a, a shot example of something subtle you can do with, like I said, breathing cycle. I just noticed there's a mouse in the sound over the screen. Hold on. Um, here is an example of two bouncing balls. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to feel a difference, but not necessarily to see a difference. Um, my next tip is going to be about manipulating graph editor handles to uh, get variable spacing. Um, so the, run, the, the ball on the right is something I call burst spacing. Um, and I do that with using free tangents in the graph editor. Um, so here's a breakdown of the, the bouncing balls. Um, the only difference between them is the one frame before the, uh, the contact with the ground, it, f it favors the frame before it. 
Um, this is not necessarily realistic, but it's good for snappy animation and stylized stuff where you just want the impact to feel harder because the viewer's eyes is going to stick to that frame. Then there's going to be a big blob of missing data and your brain is going to interpret that as a harder motion hit. Um, I'm, done, I'm doing this with the V hotkey. Uh, you bring up the, the tangent types and then uh, set it to free. And that one lets you edit the tangent handles left or right without uh, disturbing the, the other handle. This is uh, another handle technique you can use. Um, it's just flattening the handles. Uh, and this is really good if you're doing uh, robot animation and you want something to chug, per se. Um, it generates a, a mechanical moving sensation because the animation is staccatoing upstairs. Um, here's an example of a shot that I just splined. And if I wanted to feel more robotic, I'll just let the play for a little bit. Um, on the rotation up and down curves, I've added the stair-steppy feel, so it chugs as it's going up, but the, the weight and the timing is the same. So hopefully some of these help. Um, next up is going to be Pablo Fournier. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Pablo. I'm and I am an animator at the Blender Studio. Uh, I work in all the stuff. And I'm going to give you my tips. Tips number uno, the use of grease pencil. Uh, since um, uh, we did wing it, I started to use more grease pencil on my workflow. And I use it in, in two different stages. First is the planning the animation. <laughs> and later is doing the smear frames. In this case, in Winged, we could do it. Um, planning my animation, I usually start with a simple shape. It's easier. It uh, doesn't take too much time to do. In this case, it's a ball with two legs. Um, it was good to find the timing and the action beats. It's really cheap to do. Uh, you can try like different approaches, and, but at the end, when um, what you want is um, fast interaction with the director. So this is way faster than just taking the leg and posing the leg and posing this and that. Just draw some stuff in there. And then, and then, when it's approved, you uh, pose your character, following the same animation that you did already with your um, grease pencil. And save you a lot of time. Okay. Yes. Uh, you can use the same method, but with more complex um, drawings. This, I don't know if you can see it really good. It's really thin, but um, these are for pre-production for, uh, for pets. We didn't have the characters, so we took, I did some poses. Um, having a more complex drawing, it helps you to pose the character more, because you have more to play with. And it's uh, really good to explore different poses and then make it more cartoony. And later, that will help you to push the rig, trying to find that poses you draw before. Always trying to pose and to push your rig with um, in 3D is more difficult to do than doing with 2D. It's simpler to do line of action with the stroke that trying to pose, trying to pose a full column, for example. So, okay. yeah. uh, smear frames. Uh, the smear frames depends on the project. Uh, if you have something um, hyper realistic like charge, you don't do it. Uh, if you have something like funny as, uh, as wing it, you can go as crazy as you want. Um, you have a different type of, um, of uh, smear frames. They can be lines, they can be multiples, they can be blobs, they can be shapes. The, but the main idea is making your animation flow better between poses, between fast poses. This is a shot I worked. I, uh, yeah, it's the cat panicking and pushing buttons. Yeah. And uh, in, for this case, I use a line approach. So the they were like scribbles, trying to imitate the arms. Uh, I put the different colors 
in this case it was like the blue and the red and the gray trying to match the different colors of the arm itself, of the geometry. Um, uh, I try to use the, the smears to complement the movement. That means that um, they initiate, they have to follow the, the, the first, the post before and the post after. Otherwise, it's going to be like really weird arcs and uh, you're not going to be able to register the, the movement. And uh, mm, most of the times, this should be one frame in the screen. It's something that you need to feel, so not something that you need to see. In some cases, you can add two frames, but most of the time, it's just one frame. Yes. In this case, I have a shot from a sprite flight. Um, they, it's a, they, in the bat has some smear frames. Probably you don't see anything, but I'm going to slow down for you. Slow down for you. Yes. Yeah. In this case, the, um, the approach was more like a color shape. I tried to um, uh, show the direction by making the shapes farther away from the movement smaller. And then the bud, as they were co going closer to the bud, they are growing in size. I don't know if you can see anything. Otherwise, so you can see it on YouTube. So, tips number two is the post library. Post library is really important for us to try to keep the consistency between the different shots and the different animators. We, each animator has his own style to animate. Um, you need to unify it because the character it needs to be the same character. <laughs> so post library, it helps us with that. Uh, also, it helps us to be a model. Um, yeah, it's difficult to, dif to work with different animators and keep like Ellie being Ellie all the time, or the dog being the dog all the time. And the most important is save us a lot of time while we are doing the process, like the animation process. It's uh, easier to just um, mix poses or um, click in poses that have to recreate a lot of controllers, like do it just with a lot of controllers. Um, the creation of poses uh, ideally should be in pre-production, not always happens, but then you have to be faster doing the poses that they, you want to do. Uh, how we do it is we define an stream array of expo uh, emotions as far away as we can and as po um, stream away that we can. So if we have a, like a surprise, it's going to be a like, really big surprise. If it's a smile, it's going to be a super big smile. Later, it's, uh, going to be easier to mix between the different poses if you have more range to work with. Uh, we add lip sync if it's needed. Most of our movies, they don't have any lip sync. But if you have to, put them in there. And hands, please put hands. It takes too much time to animate fingers. Uh, and this is how we use it. We have here our beautiful cat. And that's how it looks. So the thing is. Um, not always the resting pose that comes with the, from the rigging is the pose that is the best for the, for the character. So you need to create a default pose for the character in animation. And later, it's easier to apply the different um, poses just by clicking if you need it. Um, we used to do all the poses uh, favorite one side of, of the face. Later, it's super easy to just mirror the pose or um, yeah, copy and post, um, paste it. And then you have your cat smiling. In a, sort of, in a sort of environment, when you're working on a shot, most of the time you um, work with, a, with the base of the post library. And later, you start to add different flavors of other poses. Uh, we do that by using a selection sets that we are created before. Most of the times, it's like upper head, lower head. And later, you separate. Uh, eyebrows and eyes or something like that. So you can uh, sprinkle some different emotions, but within a big emotion that you have already. Um, yeah, it's super easy to, um, to apply to different parts if you have the selection sets. And uh, yeah, you can or put the full pose that most of the time we don't do that, but it's more like the dragging and, and sliding and you mix with the, with the pose that you want to, um, want to have as a main emotion. 
Tip three, uh, the tools I use. I like to use the blend to neighbor. It's uh, really easy to create in between once you have already your key poses. And I like to create in between almost on tools to show to my directors or, or to show in, in the studio. Uh, I think it's super important to have everything already like packed and being on tools allow you to, when you go to spline, it's not a um, really headache later to make the, um, the spline version of, uh, of the shot. And it's easier to show the supervisor because you have more information. Uh, with the blend to neighbor, it's really easy to, bl um, to delay parts of the body because you have a pose before and post, post after. You can, for example, your root can be favoring more like your pose B and your arm can be favoring your pose A. And uh, there is something I like to use is the 2080 rule. That is, when I'm creating a slowdown, I like to put uh, favoring the B pose uh, 80%. And later again, 80% and 80% like this until it slows down. And when it's accelerating, it's doing the same, but the opposite. It's doing 20, 20, 20, and then go fast. Next. Next. Motion pass. Uh, check your arcs, please. Arcs are the most important thing to make your animation look good. Otherwise, it looks like a robot and nobody likes um, I like to manipulate my uh, motion pass on my view because already my poses are already good uh, in the 3D space, but um, I want a more graphical representation of the arc. I do it in the camera view and then I can track the arc frame by frame wherever I want. And I used to do uh, the root, limbs, and the nose to follow the path that the head is doing. And I'm done. Next is, next is Tony Garcia. Hi, right. uh, what's up, y'all? My name is Tony. So I'm another member of Dylan Goose Studios. I mostly do uh, animation, rigging, and a little bit of action design. And so without wasting too much time, let us get into the tips. The first one I have for you is a collection of uh, mini tips. They're for performance and uh, just speed while you're animating to get through your shots faster. The first one is about the scene simplify option. So a lot of times when you're working with a studio rig, um, you know, there's a lot of geometry in the rig. There's a lot of, you know, this, the background can be very heavy. There's a lot of subdivision modifiers on the characters. And there's a setting in the um, render settings, the render settings panel. Uh, it's a checkbox, the simplify. And then below that, there's a menu for viewport. And if you set that to zero, it'll turn all your subdivs off um, globally. And it can help you gain FPS so that you can um, like, you know, critique your animation and see what you're actually going to see in the final export. So if you look at the frame rate there, 5 FPS was a one character scene from one of our productions. And with Simplify On, we get 24 FPS. So the difference can be quite drastic. The second mini tip is for isolating curves in the graph editor. Um, when you're working in the graph editor, there's typically, especially in Blender, there's a lot of visual clutter. And so the uh, isolating curves is a very easy, easy way to just take down the visual clutter so you can focus on the curve that you're working on. So all you have to do is uh, just click on either the channel name, you can click on the key, or you can click on the curve itself. And it'll be highlighted, and if you press Shift-H, it'll isolate that curve from the rest of the curves. And you can work on that curve. You can make sure you know, everything needs is to your liking. Um, and then when you want to bring all the curves back, you just do Alt-H, and everything is back to normal. Next tip is uh, graph editor filters. So there's a search bar in the top, of, top left of the graph editor. And what that lets you do is search uh, by channel name. So if you have a bunch of controls, so for example, if I wanted to tone down the performance of my shoulder animation, you could select both of the shoulders, and if you type XR, or excuse me, XE for X Euler rotation, it'll filter and only show the X curves for Euler rotation. And then you can you know, scale down the curves. Um, uh, you can do that for location and scale. And so on the cheat sheet there, there's a couple of um, just quick things you can type in just to make sure uh, that you can find the curve that you want. 
And then the next thing that I want to talk about is, um, it's another speed tip, but it's a little more convoluted. Um, and it's what I like to call pivot switching. So pivot switching, all it really is, is taking advantage of this Pi menu in Blender. You can access it with the default hotkey of the period on the keyboard, not the number pad. Um, and it lets you just dynamically switch between median point and individual origins, which I think probably most animators will use um, when they're animating in Blender. But it also gives you very quick access to active element. An active element is super useful because there is a, a feature in Blender where uh, if you select a control and you select it again, the control will be deselected so you can't uh, manipulate it with any of your gizmos or your transform hotkeys. But it'll still be the active element because it is the last selected control. And it's very useful for me, if you're like me, you animate like 95% FK or IK. Um, but you can actually move the IK like an FK. All you have to do is select the IK hand, select a control at the base of the arm, select it again, it'll be deselected, so you don't have to worry about accidentally moving it. But since it's the last selected control, it'll be the active element. And you can then move it like an IK, you can pose it like an IK, and it makes doing um, all IK animation super fast. You can um, pose faster and therefore animate faster. And then the next slide is just a couple of more um, rather extreme examples of what you could do. So in the gift on the left, you could theoretically make a character uh, swing around a bar without having to do any space switching or set up any constraints, um, and you can block it in very quick and dirty. The gift on the right is something that I do quite frequently. When I'm making a character flip through the air, um, I find it more intuitive to have the pivot more in the chest area rather than down at the hips where the center of gravity or the torso normally is. And so with active element, you can very easily move the pivot up into the chest, and then you can pose the character, you can move it in you know, world space, you can rotate it, and because the chest is where the last selected control is, uh, it'll always pivot around that point. So it's location independent, constraint independent, hierarchy independent. And it's very, uh, yeah, it's very useful for just posing things very fast. And then the last thing I thought I'd throw in was the only locations checkbox. That's in the top right of that Pi menu I showed you earlier. What only locations does is in the name, it disables scale and rotation manipulation in the viewport. Um, so that means that if you manipulate those channels, nothing will happen. But what you can do is if you take two controls, and you scale them together, they'll get closer together, but they won't get smaller. Or they'll get further apart, but they won't get bigger. And so that means that you can very quickly adjust the width of a character's stance. You can scrunch the eyebrows together uh, very quickly. It's a little bit more of a niche uh, use case, but because it's on the Pi menu, it's very easy to access. And just when I'm animating, you'll see me flicking the Pi menu, all kinds of crazy. And the third tip is a little bit more uh, theoretical, conceptual, but since I'm an animator who does a lot of action scenes and um, designs a lot of action scenes, I wanted to talk about depth in action animation and in particular how it contributes to dynamic movement in your frame and how it makes the watching uh, action scenes more engaging. And typically when you're talking about using depth in your animation, um, you're typically pairing that with short lenses. Um, so it's uh, somewhere usually like 35, 30 millimeters and below. And what that does is uh, it exaggerates Z space. And so, um, uh, you, you don't always need a short lens when you're um, animating these because there are times when you, some productions will not give you as much control over the camera or there will be for a particular shot composition reason you're gonna be wanting a high focal length. Because animation, I just wanted to, as an aside, mention that you can, you can fake depth with scale and stretch. Um, and so when you're looking for opportunities to use depth, uh, don't be afraid to distort the rig. Because using depth is super important. Um, so these are some examples of fantastic action scenes. And um, like I said, uh, a good, probably I would say 50 to 60% of dynamic movement in your frame when it comes to action scenes is just stuff moving toward camera and away from camera. And so you can see like in the example of the Puss in Boots movie, when he throws Puss, Wolf puts his face super close to camera. It works great as an anticipation. Um, and because it's coming at camera, we feel it more viscerally. And um, that's, I think, because when things come at camera, they're coming at the audience point of view. And because our brains can't differentiate whether or not it's an animation or actually something potentially dangerous, um, I think we tend to feel Z-space animation more viscerally. 
And so the two GIFs on the right are also good examples. Um, you can see in the, in the animation there, he slides at the camera. Uh, in here, the attack is going to hit the camera at the end. In here, the face is coming at the camera. And then in here, again, he's sliding at the camera. In the GIF on the bottom, it's very interesting because in that example, the character's Z space animation is actually very subdued. He's not moving too much in Z space. You can see he jumps here. He gets a little bit close to camera. Like, that's a very dynamic uh, pose. But most of the motion is coming from the elements of the background rushing away from camera. And also the big thing that he's running from in the back that is getting closer to him, and it's also getting closer to camera in the frame. And that um, slow but buildup of Z space, um, like when it's getting closer, it builds a lot of tension in that scene and that camera angle. And so if you're going to animate action scenes, um, just try to keep a lookout for where you can use depth to build tension and make it more engaging and, and dynamic. And then the last tip I have, uh, my favorite tip, is use a vertical mouse. So uh, vertical mice are, they keep your arm in a more ergonomic position as you work. You know, they don't have your, uh, your arm bones twisted. Um, so it helps prevent RSIs and carpal tunnel. Um, and of course, as an animator and as, just as an artist in general, you're, your wrist health is very important. So if you're not using a vertical mouse or at least a stylus or something, I recommend at least trying it and seeing if it works for you. Um, but then with that said, I think that's it. It's uh, time for Dylan. Yeah, I, uh, I take credit for the vertical mouse thing. Just saying. Yeah. No, it's great. It's great. Please do. Tell, tell more people about it. So, uh, my name is Dylan Gu. I am an animator uh, and also the founder of Dylan Gu Studios. Uh, technically, I'm the animation director now. I used to do all the animation myself, but these guys are fantastic. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, so I help out. I also did the, uh, the Blender Fundamentals series, if you guys are familiar with that. That's just a tutorial thing, just fun fact. And I have a YouTube channel called Dylan Gu. Surprise, surprise. All right. Uh, just a warning to you guys, I pronounce it GIF not GIF, so you're going to hear me say that a couple of times. <laughs> it's better. It's okay. Cool. Come on. Yeah, okay. All right, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Add some phlegm in there. It's a lot better, yeah. Um, so my first tip is layered animation. So this is something that I sort of uh, self-taught myself on what I preferred to do myself when I wanted to work a little faster. And this had a lot to do with... Uh, like, I didn't really learn blocking, which, you know, was probably bad, but that's okay. But I did this, and I thought it was actually quite intuitive. And the main thing was leading with the action bone. What that means is what action is being performed by what bone first, and then everything else kind of follows. And so in a lot of cases for body mechanics, it is typically the cog or the center of gravity. So if you move that first and you get a good arc down and you get good movement down, you can understand sort of how the center of mass is supposed to work. And from there, um, you can actually move the legs and the arms and stuff like that afterwards. Now for acting, just to add a tip here, it's usually the head or the eyes. The acting is sort of led by the eyes. What do people see? What are their inputs? And then they sort of react. So you want to start with that instead. But anyway, um, this is sort of after animating the cog, then you do the legs. And you can kind of understand like intuitively how they're supposed to balance out with the arcs of the cog and stuff like that. And in this case, for example, it is the leg. Sometimes it can be something else. If it's like a cartwheel or something, maybe you want to do the hands first, for example, stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's a very dynamic process, but you can figure out what you want to do first. The important thing is as you're working on it, you want to make sure that this is a conversation between the bones. So you start out with the cog and then you add the extra bones on top and you realize, you know, okay, so this will affect it a little differently. Maybe you want to place the leg a little differently and then you adjust it as you go. But in this way, you kind of have a good understanding of how the weight distribution is the entire way through. You don't have to worry about guessing anything in particular if you move the leg first and then you have to move the torso later. It's a prevention of like wasted work essentially. So this is how I typically work. It's a very uh, intuitive workflow for me. I also do blocking, but for body mechanics, I actually prefer this method personally. We also have this. This is one of my favorite tips because uh, not a lot of software has functional and beautiful dope sheets like Blender does. And Blender's dope sheet has this amazing feature where you can just drag and drop keyframes wherever you want. And this is a feature that uh, I've taken advantage of in the dope sheet offsets workflow for FK chains. 
So I don't know how many people know about this. I think it's a pretty popular thing to do, but maybe it doesn't have a name. I call it the stair step method. But essentially what you can do is you can offset these animations for an FK chain to get something that feels kind of like follow through, something that feels a little bit more natural, like a tail uh, or ears or hair or something like that. And so you can get something very workable right off the bat for a simple animation. Now, obviously, if you want to make something more complicated, you should have a better rig than an FK chain. But if you only have that to work with, you can actually get quite far, which I think is pretty cool. And you can do this for other things too, like just offsetting stuff in a chain itself or in, in like the hierarchy of the body. You can get a lot, of, uh, a lot out of that as well. So that's dope sheet offsets. And then we have handle types. We talked a little bit about handle types from uh, Raymond over there. Uh, there's, there's a free handle type. I really like the vector handle type. And I wanted to talk about how you can use the handle type to actually avoid using the graph editor as much as you have to. So full confession, I used Blender for six years before I knew the graph editor was really a thing, OK? So I used the dope sheet exclusively for a long time. And the reason why was because I got very familiar with how handle types operate in the dope sheet. So if you understand how handle types work and how like, you know, the Bezier interpolation and stuff can be manipulated in the dope sheet itself, you can get away with a lot of things just with how great the dope sheet is. So in this example, you can actually change the handle type in this bouncy ball. You have the keyframes there, but without going to the graph editor, editor at all and not looking at like the actual curves, you can actually just set these particular keyframes as vector, which will add a sort of like sharp point at the bottom, which makes it bounce. And you can get a very natural looking bounce very quickly without having to worry about the actual handles themselves. You're not going in there. You're not manipulating anything. I'm only showing you so I can prove that it works. Um, but that, I didn't even see what it was doing when I was <laughs> working on it six years ago. But here you go. So that's how handle types actually work, and they can be very, very helpful. Now, this is a bit of a bonus tip. Um, I found this out last year, actually. Apparently, you can animate even faster with a bouncy ball if you just use the balance interpolation. It's just two keyframes. It's done. Anyway, if you're in school for animation, don't use this. It's, eh, don't tell them it was for me anyway. So there you go. And next we have the legendary Hjalti Hjalmarsson. Hello. Hey, guys. They left me with three minutes, and I have uh, 42 tips to go through. So let's, <laughs> let's do this. OK, so uh, yes, where am I looking? This, yeah. So uh, this, is, this is like a thing that it doesn't matter if it's Blender or whatever software. As you start off, you're going to have a lot of shortcuts in the beginning that probably make kind of sense. You know, there's um, uh, like in Blender, for example, there's all oh, the arrow keys are kind of transversing through time and the timeline and whatnot. But as you get better, just have in mind that it makes sense to um, to not move your left hand too much because that's what you're actively doing if you're using the entire keyboard with all the shortcuts all around. And uh, you are constantly also looking down on your keyboard. And this is like the worst part is that you're letting go of your mouse as you're working because you want to hit some shortcuts. So uh, don't do this right away when you're starting out, but just have in mind that if you want to be more proficient and efficient uh, at what you're doing, just start migrating everything to the left side of the keyboard. And uh, how to do it, it's up to you because everybody here uses uh, you know, Blender for different things and they, even the animators here are, are using different methods and you know, they have different muscle memories for what makes sense to them. Uh, tip number two. Uh, that being said, I do want to give you like a, a little glimpse into something that I did that I found really useful and, and uh, nice. So let's say you just have some animation that, um, you know, something simple, and you want to go through the frame stepping. I just did it. I made one and two on my keyboard be that. So it's very within reach. And I wasn't really taking away anything I was using. Uh, but then I have three and four as jumping between keys. So I can like easily verify the posing that I'm doing. But then on top of that, five and six are markers. So if I want to kind of A, B test something, I just slap a couple of markers there, and now I can kind of go through that. It's kind of the equivalent of old school animators where they have their pieces of paper and they're kind of flipping through the paper and also only choosing the extreme poses of their papers and flipping through them. Uh, so it's very handy. And then uh, so you have all of these. And then the question is, uh, 
aren't you going to get confused uh, because you're going to have to look down and be like, oh, where are my fingers? So you know how like you want to buy a keyboard or a mouse or whatever, and it seems like everything is made for gamers. Everything has like really edgy uh, design and whatnot. So I, my keyboard was completely broken at the studio, so they bought a new one. And it's this, you know, razor ash or whatever that has like LEDs and whatnot, whatever. But it came with these like weird little buttons, tactile buttons, so you can swap them out for the buttons. And you know, it's meant for like gaming, so AESDF and all of that stuff. But I like, ah, let me just try something. So I, I swapped out my scale rotation uh, grab. And so I always feel tactilely where my fingers are as I'm working. And then for that tip that I just told you, for the three and four, I replaced it with, I don't know, they didn't have a G, so there's two Fs now and whatever, <laughs> who cares? I'm never looking down at the keyboard anyway. So uh, I always know if I'm at a one and two, and then there's like a little hill, and then three, four, and then five, six. Uh, number four, the, uh, I kind of like doing, uh, having shortcuts that do similar thing, but um, in different ways. So uh, for this to like kind of tick, 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 tick go through, it's great when you're doing something very precise, but when you do want to do it really quickly, I think everybody here knows that uh, if you use the, if you hold down the Alt key and you're scrolling, uh, it'll kind of just scroll through the frames. This is a thing that's already in Blender. Uh, it's counterintuitive to me because it goes the wrong way how my mind works. So I had to flip it, but I think I don't think that's a problem for anybody else. Uh, but what I did add to it is, yeah, hold down Control and now you're skipping through keyframes, and hold down Control and Alt and now you're skipping through markers. So it just made it very handy to you know, do that flipping very quickly. And number five, this is gonna be my, me on a soapbox with my animation snobbery, I'm so sorry. So like take this with a pinch of salt because shots are different, so it depends on what you're doing. But this is a thing that I keep seeing again and again and again, especially with junior animators. And it's basically, uh, they get too eager going through the steps of animating a shot. So there is, you know, this is kind of roughly like you have kind of the planning phase and then blocking, blocking plus, splining, polish. These are, uh, you know, kind of cliche ways of doing it, but yeah, I don't like the terminology either. Blocking plus, what the hell does that mean? But the um, thing is, what I see way too often is that, uh, you know, usually shots are different. So, you know, when it comes to uh, how long each part takes, it, it kind of depends. The thing I see a lot is this, which is where you know the planning goes okay, they start blocking out and uh, they get approval from the director and then they add a few more poses and then they get so eager they start splining. And now that ends up being this horrible thing that they have to rein back in and try to get that snappiness back that they used to have there. Director has some notes but it's really hard to address them now because everything's kind of swimming around. Um, so, oh my God, the font has, okay. Imagine that you can read this. So this is just like kind of, you know, this, this is where the kind of snobbery comes in. So I like, please stop splining too early because what will happen is you'll get these, um, you'll get these poses in between that are coming from the computer and not from you. You didn't craft them. So as you, uh, as you go for a feedback session, you give it to the director and the director sees a bunch of shit like your poses are somewhere in between other poses that are not really representative of what is supposed to be happening there. And, you know, so I kind of call them like unintentional interpolated poses, which is kind of what's cluttering everything up. But in real life, it's just shitty poses. But it's not your shitty poses. It's shitty because it's not coming from you. It's not your intention to show these poses. Uh, it's really hard to get feed, give feedback with them cluttering everything up. Uh, everything is kind of swimming. You have to kind of get your snappiness back and it can take forever. It's really hard to make changes um, or at, let's just say harder at least. And then, uh, yeah, uh, your eyes get really numb to it. So as you are looking at it again and again and again, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why so many people have a hard time kind of regaining the snappiness that used to be there in the, in the previous uh, step in the process. So. Oh yeah, yeah, it takes language to polish. Um, but then this is what I would do on a typical shot. 
And the thing is, I spent way more time investing in the blocking plus phase. It was basically just means that I've blocked out my shot, everything, I've gotten a thumbs up from the director, and then as I go into the next stage, I just keep adding critical breakdown poses in between my kind of key poses. And, in, and I go from there again and again and again until I've honed the entire performance. And there were a couple of instances where I gave a shot away to the next team that was rendering and they were yelling at me because uh, the motion blur wasn't working. And it turns out that my animation, which was on once, wasn't splined underneath the hood. I had never taken it out of the stepped constant thing. So, uh, but it was just animated on once. I had just done all the, every single um, pose in between, which is fine. That's, that's due diligence. That's how you do it. <laughs> Uh, so the kind of the upside of doing this is that you have way more solid foundation as you are moving along. Uh, it's way better for feedback. Uh, it's way better for like kind of stronger poses because as you are looking at the poses and as you go along, you might want to go back to a pose and strengthen it. And it's very easy to compare poses now because you're only dealing with the most extreme poses at any given moment. Um, it is easier to address notes. So if, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, that acting beat, I don't know if that works. Oh, okay. That, you know, I'm only having to deal with a couple of poses instead of like these kind of 20 poses that are half mine and half not. Uh, yeah, faster in the long run. That's actually the thing, you know, once you, once you get really eager and you want to spline really quickly, you have the illusion that you're actually going great. Like your timing is great. Oh, the deadline is way over and it ends up being that you just burn through your time and now you're way late with your shot. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, our biggest worry with this was time and we have eight minutes left, so I think we did good. Um, yeah, we had a, like 106 slides, so things work. Um, since we have a bit more time, that's the wrong direction. Um, this is a crowd question. Would you like Q and A, uh, so we can repeat stuff if we went too fast, or would you like um, like a speed round of tips? Speed round. Speed round. Okay. Um, I made a few slides, but you guys can make speed rounds if you have anything off the top of your head. Say something relevant. I we're going through speed round. Um, this is an add-on by Cody Winchester. He's right there. Uh, he's great. Uh, this add-on lets you uh, pretty much pin the face uh, to the, the camera view, so like when your camera move is moving, uh, the character stays stationary in screen. Uh, this is especially useful if you have a character running everywhere and you still need to do lip sync and you're crying. Um, math works in Blender. Uh, you can use math and it's good. Uh, you, can <laughs> uh, you can input commands like GX plus 50 and it'll move whatever you have in the graph editor or in the viewport by 50 units in the in X. Um, you can use this to retime animation. If you're if you're scaling animation, it's uh, it's best if you turn off frame snapping. Uh, in the bottom right, uh, in the graph editor, there's a little thingy. This is not a directional mic. Um, yeah, if, if you turn off snapping, then you can scale animation, and it'll preserve all the animation data you had without breaking anything. Uh, decimate keyframes, this was made by Sebastian Parbog from Blender. Um, if you need to reduce your keyframes, uh, you can use the decimate operator. And if you combine that with, uh, what was it? The, the, the K hotkey, which selects uh, every keyframe on each column selected, then you invert it and run decimate again. It'll decimate all the curves based on your original first curve. So everything will be on whole keys. Um, this is how I prep a scene for lip sync because audio files are kind of a pain to manage. Uh, if you open up the sequencer, pop it up and show waveforms. Um, then if you hit the sync visible range button between the graph editor and the, the, uh, the sequencer, when you're scrubbing, the, the 2D cursor will be aligned. Um, so it just makes things a bit easier for lip sync. And then I'll have a reference on the side. And this is usually how I prep lip sync scenes. It's kind of muddy. Um, it'll look like that. Uh, the, the time slide tool is pretty cool in the dope sheet. If you hit Shift T, um, it'll grab the animation that you have and move it based on wherever the mouse selection is. 
Um, but it doesn't change the end, the start or the end poses, uh, timing-wise. It just moves everything in the center. So if you like, if you're used to editing videos and like moving keys around like this, this is very helpful. Um, that's all the things I prepped for the speed round. Does anyone have anything to say? No. Okay. We're, huh? Thank you for coming. Yeah. Uh, we got five minutes for questions. If anyone wants questions. Cool. We good? No? Good. Okay. I think, well, question. Um, the question was, is there a trick for the decimate uh, operator if uh, to get it to not change your keyframe type? The handle type. Oh, uh, no, I think the, it works based on, like it's trying to match whatever the original curve was but by using the handles. Um, but instead of the, the decimate operator, you, I think there's different ways to filter out the curves if you want. Um, like the, the Alt S hotkey will bring up the smooth operators in 3.6 and above. Um, the, it's, it's a bit of a weird topic for like reducing keyframes. Uh, question. Uh, question was, if we use Cascador or any physics-based animation, I tried the free demo, um, and I animated a backflip in it, and it looked bad, and I didn't want to touch it again. <laughs> but that, that was more on me part, because I did not use the software. Uh, any other question? Another question? Um, this was a tip that I had to cut because I thought I had no time. Uh, please color your keyframes. Please, 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 please. It doesn't matter which color. There's not a lot of colors. And honestly, there's like, you know, there's the pink, there's the green, there's the blue. For me, per and there's others, but the others just kind of look like the original one. So ignore that. There's the yellow, but whatever. Uh, those three, please do it. Uh, for me, I don't know why, but I went with like the pink are the kind of uh, usually my extreme poses. Then the blue comes next and then the green. Uh, and then anything that isn't that, that just means that I'm still working on it. And as I go along with a shot, uh, let's say uh, there's a shot that I haven't worked on for two weeks or whatever, and I have to return to it. At a glance, I will see which keys I'm, am I the most confident with. And so I kind of see a slight gradient there of, ah, oh, this is stuff I was kind of still trying to figure out. And this is stuff that is like rock solid and I feel really solid about it. Thank you. <laughs> I have one, uh, one tip, one tip. Don't fall in love with your poses. Don't fall in love with your job. You will have to delete everything. Um, try to show... Cut the mic. Cut the mic. <laughs> try to show your uh, blogging as soon as possible to um, find out if you're in the right direction. Because at the end, it's not... If, unless you're the director, if you're animated for somebody, it's not your shot. Uh, check with your, your director if you are in the right, right track. You will save your brains and you will not burn out. <laughs> um, I think we've got two minutes. Was there another question? I saw a hand. Uh, yeah. yeah. The color of the frames doesn't really do anything. There's no tools that use it. This is plainly for your own. You just, in the doxy letter, and you hit R, and it just gives you a couple of colors. And you can just color the... I was just wondering, because I, I kept coloring the keyframes, and I was hoping, hey, maybe some tools actually use that. Like, no, it's it's purely color. color. Okay. <laughs> just organization. Your eyes, your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Use a filter based on the color of your... Uh, I did not know that. There, there is an add-on that you can use to filter your uh, based on the color keys. So if you mm. have your uh, keyframes, you're the stick one. <laughs> <laughs> So I was saying that there's a, in uh, Grease Pencil there is an add-on that you can uh, filter your uh, poses. So if you want to see only um, stream poses, you color them in one way and then you can filter just flipping between them and you don't have to see the rest of the poses. Uh, I think that's it on time. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, hopefully you guys learned something today um, because we had a lot of different minds and a lot of different workflows. I think some of ours conflicted, but you know, it, it works. <laughs> you, can, you can choose whatever you want to pick from this, um, but the, the point is just to share information. Um, so maybe hopefully we'll do this again sometime. Thank you. <laughs>